in this episode of Outback Coroner. Do you recall what was said? No, it was just, you know, look at this, this is my new plane. How good's this? I can see there's a clear way in through the top of the trees. I can see where the aircraft is impacted. We give a voice to that dead person by saying, look, this is what happened to me. He did try and change gears, but he couldn't. He was trying to go into reverse and that yeah, was it, just yeah. panic. He wouldn't have got across. You don't need a, a search party to figure that out. I mean, she even left notes to say she was doing it. trip today is to conduct an inquest into the number of deaths which resulted from a aircraft crash. Deputy State Coroner Paul McMahon is experienced when it comes to aviation fatalities. I've done quite a lot of matters involving aircraft crashes. These are always very difficult matters for uh, families involved. And we have at the moment a number of cases where uh, people have flown into clouds with mountains behind them and invariably that uh, results in their death. Paul McMahon has come to Scone in the Upper Hunter Valley to look into the crash of a single engine Cessna that resulted in the deaths of three people in the mountains out behind the town. Pilot Scott Menrath, his partner Monique Fraser and their son Daniel were travelling from Sydney to Brisbane when their plane crashed into rugged bushland shortly after taking off from Scone Airport. The family was on its maiden flight in the Cessna 206 and had stopped to refuel after picking up the plane earlier in the day. The things which I always do is look at the matter that I'm investigating to see whether or not we can learn messages. Because if you can learn from the circumstances and if you can make recommendations to prevent such injuries or deaths occurring, then you're making a contribution to society. From Scone, we travel down south to the dramatically beautiful island state of Tasmania. Down here, the coronial jurisdiction deals with missing persons and often enough, crash investigations. Tasmania has a very quick change in weather patterns. I mean, you can have it sunny one moment and then an hour later it could be snowing in the highlands. For coroner Don Jones, Tasmania's natural beauty can also attract tragedy. We've had deaths with people going up through the Great Lakes and through our mountains where they get lost. People don't realise the size of Tasmania. They think it's very small and they don't always prepare themselves appropriately for our conditions. It's a different type of environment here and it can be quite treacherous if you're not aware of it. Don Jones is the island's longest serving coroner and has been seeking answers to unexplained deaths for 19 years. You do take on the tragedy and that's something you can't, I believe, avoid totally. Every death you do, you feel for, the, for that person who has lost a loved one, a father, a mother, a brother, sister. And that person that you have investigated, you know them so well. Probably more than their family do in some cases. Amongst the coroner's files are two cases that demand his attention. 68-year-old Robert Joblin was driving towards a railway crossing on a quiet country road when a thousand-ton freight train crashed into his car, killing him instantly. That, of course, immediately raises issues. You think, well, OK, why would you run into a train? The second case involves Susan Madden, a mother of two who disappeared in dense mountainous bushland. And of course, you, you must consider all avenues. And by that, I mean suicide and accident. So many factors that could have caused or contributed to the death. In spite of the beauty of the place, Tasmania has a high suicide rate. And while considering these two cases, that statistic weighs heavily on the coroner. 
It was here, in the Hunter Valley of New South Wales, that a small plane crashed, killing three people. Unfortunately, the coroner has seen tragic events like this many times before. I like doing coronial work. I can see that for everybody, it wouldn't be a career choice. There are pressures on coroners which are not on others. You're dealing with dead people. More importantly, uh, you're dealing with the relatives and the survivors of traumatic events. There is grief involved uh, and the management of that grief does affect the way in which you attend to your judicial functions. Sons, please all stand. Coroner Paul McMahon has come to Scone to conduct an inquest in the hope that a similar tragedy will be averted in the future. Yes. Good afternoon, Your Honour. Advocate Lawrence assisting Your Honour today in relation to three matters, those being Scott Menrath, Monique Fraser and Daniel Fraser. Around August 2008, Your Honour, Scott Menrath made arrangements to purchase a Cessna 206 VHJDQ, a single engine general aviation aircraft described as the sports utility vehicle of the air. The major issue the coroner needs to determine is what caused the crash and the death of three people. Was it the weather, mechanical failure, or pilot error? He collected the aircraft from Bankstown Airport. He was taking it back to Archerfield in Queensland where he was going to station it. Scott was going to use the plane for a new business venture, ferrying people from his hometown, Brisbane, out to Morton Island. I picked them up, I, I saw them standing at the front. He had, hadn't told me that he was bringing his wife and son and it surprised me. Previous owner Michael Tickner was showing the plane to Scott. The last thing I would want, picking up a brand new aircraft that I was unfamiliar with, is um, to have to worry about my wife and son. He was looking through the plane and walking around it and having quite an animated discussion, I think, with his, with his wife. Do you recall what was said? No, it was just, you know, look at this, this is my new plane. You know, how good's this? Scott's parents, Victor and Helen Menrath, have travelled from Queensland seeking answers from the coroner. It's the case that he didn't tell you he was going to purchase Correct. the plane? And, yeah. and I, do you would, know why? He, he knew that we would be angry, Helen and I, because he was selling his business and I wanted all that cleared off before he took on the burden of another... Operation, so yeah. to speak, yep. Oh, I think he was just obsessed with, with flying. And excited about this yeah. potential operation um, to Morton Island. Absolutely. The two things folded in together perfectly for him, as far as he was concerned. Mr Manrath was a keen aviator. He was passed for his pilot's licence by a man who's got a reputation as being fairly rigorous as an assessor. Scott took the plane up for a test run, along with Michael Tickner the previous owner. He, you know, he took off well. He lifted the plane off beautifully. I, I felt comfortable with him flying. And then when he landed, whether it was luck or good management, he, he greased it. It was a good landing. I was involved in the search for the missing aircraft. My overall role was to oversight and manage any subsequent investigative process should the aircraft be located and if uh, deceased persons were on board that aircraft. When there's an aviation accident, uh, the first people on the ground are the police. They secure the location. Inspector Hurley, in charge of police aviation, will, if he can, go to the site. So we're looking for disruption in the foliage, though so things that aren't natural. So as we're coming around here, and that's the crash site down there at about 10 o'clock off the nose, I can see there's a clear way in through the top of the trees. I can see where the aircraft is impacted and the componentry is dispersed along the ground. Once the aircraft was located, the site was secured. We had local police attend the site and shut it down. John Hurley was one of the first investigators to visit the scene. Myself and the crewman walked in here. It was, it was pretty quiet. It wasn't snowing like it is now. It was quite windy when we landed and strangely all the wind stopped. And, uh, and as we approached, being mindful, there was a strong smell of um, fuel. 
and there were bits and pieces of debris. Uh, so we just followed the wreckage trail up to where the aircraft had impacted the trees and could see that um, Scott and Monique were in the aircraft. Scott to the rear and she was at the front, obviously deceased. And uh, being aware there was a little boy on the aircraft, uh, continued to walk up and that's when we found him uh, lying face down up here, um, some distance on. The circumstances in which plane crashes occur, particularly if in rugged territory, uh, can be very uh, challenging. There are many ways which are horrible ways to die. Uh, this is one of them. In Tasmania, Don Jones splits his time between coronial work and magistrate's duties. Hold the stand, please. One day you can have, say, you're doing a finding in a coronial matter, then all of a sudden you are um, sentencing somebody to jail. But you are now on the cusp where if you continue to offend, you will go to jail. It can be very confronting on one day. Don is now inquiring into the death of the man who died when a train hit his car at a level crossing. On the morning of the 5th of May 2012, retiree Robert Joblin had just collected his car from his mechanic. He'd had it serviced after a recent road trip. On his journey home, he failed to stop at a railway crossing and collided with an oncoming freight train. It's now up to the coroner to piece together what happened. His first port of call is the autopsy report. He actually died from a tear to the heart valve itself that was caused by the impact of the collision. So we know from that that A, there was no alcohol or drugs involved. We know that there was no medical reason as to why he should have crashed the vehicle. So we have to then consider, well, why did he crash? In the week before Robert Joblin died, there were three near misses at level crossings in Tasmania. Possibly in a state with few trains, drivers have become complacent. But given the state's high suicide rate, the coroner must consider the possibility that Robert Joblin was intending to end his own life. As a coroner, I like to visit the scene because there is just so much more that you can pick up by being at a scene rather than just looking at a flat photograph. And then you can try and place yourself in the position of the driver and say, okay, why did I miss the stop? And you, you try to relive that part of it, and you can only do that by being there. The crash investigator responsible for collating the facts just prior to impact was Constable Anthony Purcell. He's about to meet up with the coroner and a witness at the location of the crash. Jones, not the best of days, is it? Not the best of days. <laughs> it was very similar. On day. the day? Yeah, yeah, on the day, right. with a similar cloud. For crash yeah. investigators like Anthony, skid marks reveal the sequence of events before impact. And the skid went through about here. Right. So he's just stopped right on the line itself. That's right. Actually, these are the marks. These oh, okay. Paint marks. Yes. And here, and these these gouge. Yes. Yep. And then uh, these are more paint marks of where the the and here. Oh yes. The yep. gouge, right. gouge mark, paint. So as he skidded, he's actually skidded. I think your report said off to the left. So he skidded up here. So it's virtually placed him front on towards the train. Well, he, he skidded and, and ended up like like that across uh -huh. the line, and the train has then hit. That's caused him to spin centre. clockwise and yep. clean up over there. Back there, so he's, he's gone like that. Right, yep. Back that way. Now the coroner is about to meet a witness to the crash who may be able to answer the question, was this an accident or was Robert Joblin trying to take his own life? Jeff, how are you? Not too bad. It's been a long time, no yes. sense. Yes. Very true. It goes back about 20 years. We don't yes. cross paths that often, do we? We don't, that's no. true. No, no yeah. unfortunately. That's true. Unfortunately. By chance, Coroner Don Jones knows eyewitness Jeff Carrens, who was in his car on the opposite side of the tracks as the train hit. Beautiful day, he was just potting along, quietly going, well, not speeding anything. And he got to about the gateway, and I thought, he hasn't slowed up at all. You know, there's no brakes, just kept cruising along. 
and uh, he obviously saw the train at the last second. Slammed the brakes on. You see, he was trying to reverse the car, but I had no hope. Jeff's version of events is identical to the police, with the added observation of Robert trying to change gears. He did try and change gears, but he couldn't. He couldn't. He was trying to go into reverse, and that yeah, was it, just yeah. panic. He wouldn't have got across. He wouldn't have got across, you don't no, think? No way. He was no. going very quietly. He, he wasn't speeding. No. If he'd been speeding, he might have made through. The late braking and the changing of gears indicates that Robert was trying to save himself, and he simply ran out of time. The coroner can now rule out suicide. He now has enough evidence to make a finding and issue a warning as to the dangers of complacency. The formal findings are that Robert John Joblin died on the 5th of May 2012 at Wilmore's Lane at Longford. He died as a result of hemorrhagic shock following a collision with a train. I would recommend that an awareness program be produced and disseminated via the media to increase the public awareness of the need to exercise caution at level crossings. I wish to convey my sincere condolences to the family of the deceased. Unfortunately, one of the functions of a full-time coroner is that you are required to travel. I don't like travelling for work. I, I like my home, but it is a function of the job. I like the job, so I have to take it. Being on call and being woken up in the middle of the night by police officers for various reasons is another function of the job, which I'd rather not be woken up in the middle of the night, but it just happens. Oh, you have to switch off, whether you're at work or at, in the bush, you have to switch off because otherwise uh, you lose your humanity. Um, so you need to be an assiduous reader or engaged in some other alternative activities uh, which occupy yourself. But you need to be able to uh, go for walks after hours or if you're keen, and some people are, go for runs. Uh, I don't fit into that category. Coroner Paul McMahon's inquest into the plane crash in the mountains outside Scone continues. Mr Tickner, so, so following uh, the familiarisation flight, it's the case that you say you saw Mr Menrath refuel the plane? Yes. And then he packed his luggage into the plane and took off with Monique and Daniel? That's correct. The sad fact is that the plane should not have left the ground, as its maintenance record was by this stage more than a month out of date. Did you see the maintenance release for the plane on that day? I didn't look at it closely myself. When you say he inspected it, you, did you see him remove it from the Yeah, I saw him folder. remove it, go through it, open it out, unfold it and look at it. And he said it uh, looks, looks good to me. You didn't see that document yourself? I didn't, know. I saw it at probably the same distance between me and you. Uh, do you think, given that you were saying you were going through some of the features of the plane, that uh, it may have been helpful to have a look at it with him or, or did you consider that at the time? Um, you know, hindsight's a wonderful thing. It was leaving. I, it wasn't up to me. Sorry? It wasn't up to me. I, it, the plane was leaving. I was, you know, I wasn't going to see it again. It wasn't up to me to, uh, you know, to uh, consider it. His mistakes appear, firstly, he was keen to get back to Queensland. He made the mistake of taking off from Bankstown. The flight records showed that there were outstanding requirements, which meant that he should not have taken the plane up into the air. It's illegal to actually operate an aircraft that has the outstanding airworthiness directives recorded on the maintenance release. So by simple adherence to that rule alone, this accident would never have happened. John Hurley has worked with the coroner on 15 inquests, which have resulted in significant recommendations covering aviation safety. Detective Inspector Hurley is a highly competent detective. Detectives are just that, they are investigators. So it's a bit of a bit of a ritual. I come in in the morning when there's been a fatality overnight and get the red pen out, put another dot on the map. Every one of those red dots that you see here is a fatality that I've attended. They're only the current ones. There's not enough space on there. It's an 109 deceased. 
over uh, over a six-year period. I only deal with fatal aviation investigation. I do so on behalf of the coroner, as it relates to identity, date, place, manner and cause of death. And aviation fatalities, being a violent and unnatural death, uh, falls well and truly within that category. Each job is unique, but all of them are confronting, and today will be no different. Hey, fellas, how are you? How are you? So it's a bit later. Their, uh, their job is to actually transport the deceased from the site to the morgue. Uh, hang on, hang on, hang on. This is obviously his, um, where he's been getting his uh, fuel from. Do not touch or walk through spilled material. Wear a face shield or goggles, overalls, button to neck and wrist, chemical resistant gloves and footwear. So there's a clue about some dangers that might be present over at the side of this accident, which as you can see is way over the other side of the hill there. That's why it's always good to stop and have a look. Police stayed on site overnight and volunteer rescue workers are now in place, waiting for Hurley to arrive to supervise. You can see here we've got a lot of high hills and we're in a valley. And so if there's a bit of wind, it makes it very dangerous for helicopter operations in this sort of area. You can see the damage to the tail of the road is there. That one in particular there, what's that from? That's from the top of that. The top one, The challenge is to right the aircraft and remove the deceased. So now we're going to jack the aircraft up with some airbags, probably tie it off to a couple of trees here. Do what you've got to do to retrieve the deceased. Yeah. And I'll tell the coroner that it'll all be good. You guys know this pilot? Yeah, I do. You right with this? Yep. Right up? Yep. Doesn't get a bit distressing, mate. Yeah. You can see that uh, he's wearing a seatbelt, he's wearing a helmet. The switchology is, uh, is where it's all supposed to be. I'm not saying anything inside the aircraft that might have distracted his attention from the task. Be wrong with me, or would you guys allow me to have, be able to get his hat to the I think it's, I think it's a fine gesture. You know, yeah. right uh, good on you, mate. And you know what? Uh, it's a little thing like that that will mean a lot to them. Yeah. Come on. Ooh. You wouldn't be human if you weren't sort of affected in some way. But I have a job to do, and I think it's an expectation that police will come and investigate these matters on behalf of the coroner and provide uh, the coroner with a professionally put together investigation that will assist them in, in coming to manner and cause of why an accident's occurred. Sons, please all stand. The causes of aircraft fatalities are varied, but in the case of Scott Manrath's crash near Scone, the weather had a lot to do with it. Did you have any discussions with Mr Menrath on that day in relation to the weather? Uh, yes, before he left, I, I said to him, you know, um, that front's coming through, and if I was you, I'd go up the coast, and you'll beat that front. He said, no, I'm going to Scone. Did he say anything further about the reasons for the visit to Scone he, to he you? He mentioned that he had friends that he needed to, to visit in Scone. To get there, he could have either uh, flown up the coast, or as he chose, uh, he was going to Scone and then to Casino and then to Archerfield. That decision was a very poor decision. I had been looking at the weather to the west, watching it come across. The skies were quite dark and it was quite clear that there was very little visibility. Pilot Ben Wyndham was at Scone Airport when Scott Cessna, with Monique and Daniel on board, appeared out of the gloom 
my co-pilot and I were, I think impressed was probably the word, and somewhat surprised to see an aeroplane appear from the, from the Merc. Oh, sure see me. Scott had a friend at Scone who came to the airport to meet him. He took this video of Scott's plane landing. Well, you, you actually did see it land. That's right, yes. We couldn't quite believe that anybody was flying in, this, in those circumstances. He taxied in with confidence. There was nothing that gave me any indication uh, that he would be anything other than a, at least a very confident pilot. The fact that he, he, he got to Scone is in itself an achievement, and he was very lucky to make it this far. This photo was taken at uh, 9.53 after the aircraft had been refuelled by the same family friend and looked like some pretty severe conditions at the time. The ATSB's in jurisdiction is to examine aircraft incidents. Now, not all the incidents that they examine involve deaths, but their job is to try and make the skies safe and to prevent accidents. So we have overlapping responsibility. His friend asked him if he would like to stay at his house because he thought he might have been concerned about the weather and the pilot indicated that he wanted to get to Archerfield that day but he didn't indicate the reasons why. Scott was itching to to get going because of the weather but he was confident he was going to bypass it or outrun it or something. Do you think that may have translated to an overconfidence in his ability oh, as absolutely. a pilot? Yeah. So the pilot's friend observed the aircraft take off and another timestamp photograph indicated that the time was 9.58 at the time of takeoff. On that stormy day, Ben Wyndham was flying north to Brisbane as well. But the difference between the two pilots is that Ben is qualified to use navigation instruments to fly through clouds and bad weather. Scott was not. What of entry to the GPS is basically exactly what Menrath put into his GPS, which would be his own direct casino. The path that he has chosen takes him across some of the highest terrain outside the, the Southern Alps. The winds on that day were the strongest I've ever seen them. And if you imagine the wind is water, it comes over the, that ridge. If you had uh, water rushing over there at 100 kilometres an hour, what would the water be doing? It'd be tumbling and rolling and spilling. And that's exactly what they would have been experiencing as they departed Scone. There was no doubt he was almost reckless with cars in the way he drove them. But when it came to flying, Helen and I were terribly impressed with the way he went through all the pre-flight routine very carefully. He did everything by the book. My guess is that by the time he'd found out the weather was starting to turn bad, he was hell-bent on getting back, not only for Daniel to go to school the next day, but also because of his work. The decision was a very poor decision because firstly, the weather that he was travelling in, and secondly, he was going over the Great Dividing Range where cloud problems can arise. In hindsight now, you just ask yourself, should I have gone and said something? Should I have asked him where he was going? And, uh, and maybe stopped him. As the storm clouds gathered, Scott, Monique and Daniel flew on towards the mountains of the Great Australian Divide. The garden is a thing where I can come out here and I just forget the world. And that's the beautiful thing about it. I'm just right away from everything. The life of a Tasmanian coroner can be a lonely one. Get a lot of dead heads which Removed. You see a lot of death, um, a lot of tragedy, because you tend to get a view, I guess, of life. I mean, all you're seeing is people in court. And of course, with the community itself being a small community, so you really can't mix with people where it may influence your view if you're about to sentence. So you have a very close-knit group of friends. There's probably 10. That's all I've had for the last 19 years. So you become very insular in that way. On Don Jones' desk is the mysterious case of Susan Madden, who disappeared never to be seen again eight years ago. Her family want answers. Sue Madden was last seen at her brother's Western Creek Road property on Tuesday night and was reported missing on Friday. 60 people spent the weekend searching. 
Despite the cold and wet conditions, police remain confident of finding the grandmother alive. The question is, why did Susan go missing? Was it an accident? Or did she intend to disappear into the wilderness she loved? She was the sort of person that was never any happier than being out in the bush. She loved to paint. Uh, she loved to make things with her hands. She wasn't happy unless she was being creative and letting her artistic side be expressed. Susan had had a difficult childhood with her father suffering from mental health issues. But her fortunes changed as a young woman. Her marriage to Dad represented um, sort of security. She was like a balloon and he would ground her and stop her floating away, so... But he was a tether to her creative spirit. Peter McKenzie was the police officer in charge of coordinating the search for Susan Madden. Before she went missing eight years ago, Susan was living in a caravan on her brother Laurie's property. Susan's van was uh, in this area over here. I'm just trying to picture exactly where, but uh, it was in this area. And um, it, from memory, it was between the garage and the house. So but she was not tucked away from them as such. She was part of the family in that regard, uh, but she had her own space. Don Jones hopes to put the matter to rest, to enable the Madden family to have some closure. Well, effectively, what happens is when a person has died, the only way for them to speak then is through the coroner. They can't tell anybody, so the coroner does. People are left questioning what caused it, what went wrong, did anything go wrong? Now, you actually put yourself in the shoes of that person to try and work out what happened. So you actually give a voice to them so people understand and can then, I hope from through that, is give the family closure uh, from that death and their, their loss of a loved one. After eight happily married years, Susan's husband died in a car accident, and it was a loss she struggled with for the rest of her life. All my mother's relationship was very strong because she's such an intense person. Very intense relationships, yeah. And she was very dependent on another person. Like, if she didn't have another person in her life after my father died, she couldn't cope. She had to always have someone in her life, yeah. Back in 2005, Susan was last seen by her brother Laurie on a Tuesday. By the Friday night, he'd become very worried. On Saturday morning, the search began in earnest. Right from the outset, I'd requested the use of the Westpac uh, rescue helicopter, mainly due to the terrain. Down here around the farm, it's obviously relatively easy to search. Up behind us, we've got the Western Tears, and not only is it wilderness and very rugged wilderness, it's also very steep. Search and rescue were determined to find her, and fast. We had motorbikes, we had four-wheelers, we had the mounted uh, rescue people, horseback. We had a whole heap of bushwalkers and people who have experience in this type of terrain. The search for Susan was one of the largest search and rescue efforts in Tasmanian history. The main search area is this area through here that was searched, and the area right around here, which is in the proximity of the property itself, and then the whole area there was searched by helicopter in an attempt to locate her. We have such vast areas which are, in fact, virtually unwalked on uh, in recent times. And uh, if a person wanted to go missing, there's so many ways it can be done. A lot of people change their name and live a new life, and they're never found. Others, of course, there appears to be suspicious circumstances where they're missing. Uh, you don't know whether they may have met foul play or not. And the question as to whether Susan really wanted to be found arose when the coroner learnt that she'd actually gone missing once before, prior to coming to Tasmania to live. There was a fairly extensive search at that time uh, while she was on the mainland trying to locate her. It was unsuccessful. She, in fact, presented herself a few days later, somewhat emaciated, and indicated that she'd been 
living underneath the house where she'd been reported missing. Once they learnt of this, the searchers decided to scour her brother Laurie's property again. All these, as in under the house, in the roof, everything was actually then thoroughly searched to ensure that she wasn't just sitting somewhere or laying somewhere watching us. During that second search, a diary was found in Susan's caravan. Could this provide the coroner with clues as to what had happened to Susan? Scott Menrath was determined to reach Brisbane, so he ignored requests to stay on in Scone because of the bad weather and flew on. He would never have arrested Daniel deliberately. Never. No. He loved two things, and that was flying and Daniel. He would have firmly believed that he would have bypassed the weather. One of the things which I always do is see whether or not what happened is the result of some systemic problem. If we can identify that problem through the inquest and make recommendations, hopefully, to ensure that those problems don't occur in the future. Now you can see here as we're, we're approaching, this is a confined area here, and this is not dissimilar to what he would have been faced with. So this, this feature here that we're just going over here is gonna be about 3,000 400 feet as we go over the top of it, and his get out of jail options, so to speak, are diminishing as we get closer. If Scott wanted to climb higher to get over the mountain, the downdrafts were making that difficult. When we flew over Murrunda, we required full power and best climb speed and attitude to maintain height, and that is indicative of extremely strong downdrafts in the lee of the hills. I can't imagine what it would have been like if you got close to one of those ridges on the, on the lee side. The downdrafts would have been um, would have been terrifying. I think it would have been extremely scary. He was not qualified to fly the aircraft if he could not see uh, the distances which the, the regulations required. A pilot who is qualified for visual flight only is required to have visibility for five kilometres and is not permitted to fly into cloud. These visual flight rules are common across the country. He's actually come over here like this, and he's looked, and there's no good news. This is all cloud, what he sees. So he's decided to turn around 180 degrees and fly back to go back to Scone Airport. So he doesn't know that that mount's here. I believe he made a, a misjudgment, and 12 minutes or so down the track, he would have realised he was in trouble and turned round. The aircraft wreckage was located on top of a 3,800 foot ridge line in rugged terrain, approximately 30 nautical miles or 56 kilometres north northeast of Scone Airport. All three occupants were fatally injured and the aircraft was destroyed. Now this is a picture of the main wreckage in the foreground there. There's the impact crater with the initial impact with the ground, Your Honour. And just after that is a picture of the propeller which broke away from the engine. Basically, what we do is do a, a full and thorough inspection as best we can on the accident side of the mechanics of the, the aircraft to see if we can ascertain uh, any mechanical issue that may have been uh, in the aircraft before the accident. And we didn't identify any pre-impact defects. Despite what, what a lot of people think, these aren't simple matters that you can just simply, oh, yeah, well, he's, he's hit the trees and he's crashed. Well, why did he hit the trees? You know, another 50, 100 feet up, you can see the tree canopy here's quite high. He probably would have missed this and popped out the other side of the cloud. So it's up to the coroner to determine whether the crash was a result of bad weather or pilot error. I never thought I'd be a magistrate, to be honest. Uh, I was rather honoured when uh, the Attorney General approached me and offered me the position, uh, so I took that on. There's different ways of doing it. You can either be lazy doing it or you can dedicate yourself to it. If you do that, it's, it's not a, a nine to five job. Busy day. It's not as big as usual, it's quite small really. Mm. Mm, it's good. 
I just work most nights. You receive affidavits of several pages long. You get reports which are probably 10, 20 pages long. And I will not go into my courtroom unless I've read every single paper. I believe that's important, so I read everything and I mark them as I read them. So there's a lot in that where you're dealing with emotional issues non-stop. And that's something you have to balance. And that's where you need, a, I think, a happy home life for that for a start. Without Pat, I'd be lost. Absolutely. I mean, I come home at night, she's here. We work very well together. We've been married uh, 40 years this year, so uh, we've been together a long time. And I've seen him go through lots of bad times and lots of good times and thoroughly enjoyed what he's doing. But at times, like anyone else in any job, it, it does get to you. Sixty-year-old bushwalker Susan Madden was last seen at her caravan at Western Creek on the 9th of August, 2005. She disappeared without a trace, but left one crucial piece of evidence behind. Susan kept a very uh, extensive diary, and that diary uh, set out things that had happened to her, particularly in recent times, that had changed her uh, well-being, if I can put it that way. Towards the time that she went missing, she had gone back over her diary and highlighted particular parts of it with a red pen. And they were things that she saw as being a point of no return. The last two pages of her diary, which in fact coincide with the date that she went missing, uh, are written in red. They're written in a very strong, stylized writing. And you can sense her tenseness in what she's written. And there are notes which she's got here, struggling, struggling. She was in a relationship which uh, failed. From that time onwards, her life appears to really have gone downhill. Uh, she says, you are nothing now, because before you were together in love. It has nothing to do with power or money. Now, her family have seen the impact upon her. They have tried to give her every support possible at that time. And she says, I love you, and names particular family members and friends, and says, I'm sorry. And I think that was her final writing at that time. She has uh, left the house. It was probably in the early hours of the morning and was not seen afterwards. By late Sunday, we were starting to uh, question whether we would find her alive. After that, into the following week, uh, we were looking at a retrieval, not uh, search and rescue. We go out a lot of the time in the elements, knowing that there's strong chance that someone may not have survived, but we, we go out there to try and give closure and help, help the situation, even if we know there's no chance of survival. After five days of intensive searching by over 60 police and volunteers, the team called it a day. No trace of Susan had been found. But for months afterwards, the locals continued to comb the hills and gullies of Western Creek. Laurie held out hope for a long time. If there was any possibility she'd be out there alive, he wanted to find her. I am not surprised they were unable to find her, because I think it was her intention not to be found at that particular time. That was part of what she wanted to do and how she felt, I think, uh, from the way I can understand her was that she didn't want to upset the family with the body. She just wanted to be alone in the world and finish it. And that's what, what I think she has done. That's one of my favourite shots of me. That's a nice one. I like that one. Even to today, I still don't really have a full resolution in my mind as what's happened to Mum. So, I mean, I still wander around and, and wonder if that's someone walking down the street could be Mum. So, yeah, I... I don't know if that's just the natural grief process for me, is without having a body in a funeral, it's hard for my mind to shut that down. But, um, yeah, for Cindy Lou, she was always very clear. That's a nice one of Mum. That was beautiful. I love that shot. Yeah. She just did what she wanted to do, and she even left notes to say she was doing it, finishing her life. So it's pretty self-explanatory. You don't need a, a search party to figure that out. It's just obvious. She killed herself. Yeah. I think the only thing that families can do in this situation where, particularly with 
a lady like uh, Miss Madden is this, to think that what she did is what she wanted to do. They can't feel guilty because they couldn't have stopped it no matter what they did. Unless they chained her to a floor, they could not have stopped it. And what they should uh, acknowledge is the fact that she's done it her way, if I can put it that way, and that's what she's done. It would have been nice if she could have just done it somewhere where we could find, <laughs> we could find it. But that's her choice, isn't it? That's her right to choose. And um, I guess the challenge for those who are left behind is how to deal with it and how to get on with their lives as best as possible. So it, um, it hasn't been easy. The coroner is now ready to hand down his findings in chambers. On the evidence before me, I'm unable to find the actual cause or the nature of Miss Madden's death. But it is highly likely that having walked into the West Western Tears area, she has died of hypothermia and or exposure. I do not make any recommendations or any further comments as tragically, when a person has made a decision to end their own life, little can be done by family or friends to prevent it. I wish to convey my sincere condolences to the family of the deceased. The inquest into the Scott Menrath plane crash is reaching its conclusion. Are you able to tell His Honour, in your opinion, um, what you think happened in terms of the circumstances of that crash? Weather was formed a major contributory part and factor. Uh, it also became apparent to us, and this is quite regrettable, that um, this has come about as a result of some very uh, poor decision making on the part of um, Scott Menrath, which has ultimately led to the loss of his and uh, his passengers' lives. Well, once again, there's grief, and it's clear that pilot error was the cause of the pilot's death, but in this case, the pilot's partner and son. And that has left two families who've lost their children and their grandchild. The area around here has claimed a number of lives over the last 30 years, including a, a number of my friends and people that have been known to me. It's distressing every time this happens. And it happens every couple of years. Somebody does exactly the same thing. I hope nothing like this ever happens again and maybe some good will come out of it. He obviously broke the rules flying into that weather. But should he have been allowed to fly, I don't know. The coroner considered his findings overnight and then delivered them the following morning. There was no mechanical or medical reason for uh, the collision that was identified. Scott's piloting abilities and confidence uh, were not in dispute. The reason for uh, the collision can only be, therefore, due to poor judgment on his part. Scott's decision-making uh, was questionable. Amongst other issues, he gave consideration to the blocking of the sale of a plane if maintenance records were unsatisfactory, but concluded it is the pilot's responsibility to ensure the plane is legally airworthy. On behalf of Helen and my family, we want to thank all the people that, that were involved with this inquest. Um, we've been treated with utmost respect and sympathy and empathy, and I thank you all for that. And I guess if my son was alive, he, um, he would apologise. I express my condolences specifically to Mr and Mrs Menrath and thank you for being here uh, during the course of the inquest. And I express my condolences to the Fraser family uh, at the same time. And I adjourn.